Good morning. morning. If you find your Bible, turn with me to the book of Philippians chapter 1. Lord willing, we will finish this chapter this morning. Uh, I uh, don't often open the class up to questions, but uh, we're going to do a little of that this morning. Uh, Just understand, be diplomatic. If you're very, really strong-willed and you you must get your opinion across, (laughs) do it diplomatically, please. Amen. Uh, Philippians chapter 1, reading in verse 29 and following, it says, For unto you it is given on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, uh, but here's the second part, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which he saw in me and now here to be in me. Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you for the brief time you've given us to look into it. Uh, we're thankful, Father, that you're, uh, uh, Lord, you're our Heavenly Father, that uh, it's all of grace, that, Lord, we can go through the trials of life with your help and rejoice at the same time. May you bless, Lord, the word that's brought this morning. Help us to be good students and good listeners. Not only in this class, the others we, we pray for your help with. May you do the teaching. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me ask the first question this morning. I think just with me for a minute here. You don't have to answer, but it's, it's, a, it's a good question to start the class off with. Um, is suffering for Christ part of being a Christian? Is suffering for Christ part of being a Christian? Kind of comes with the territory, doesn't it? Amen? Um, when I was first saved, it didn't even cross my mind that, there, that not everybody was going to be in agreement with me or that everybody understood the need for Christ <clears throat> or that everybody understood that Hey, there's eternity awaits you eventually. You're going to spend your, your time somewhere. Amen. I didn't understand or comprehend that, that, that not everybody was not going to be in, a, in agreement with me, but there were going to be those who actually took it a step further and kind of got on your case about it sometimes. I think if you look across the landscape of America today, we are still for the most part, enjoying religious freedom. We're here this morning. We're not meeting secretly. That's something to give praise for and thankful, be thankful for. We're able to meet freely this morning. But there's this sense, there's this sense, though, if you pay attention, you have an understanding of the times, amen, there's this sense, though, and you can see it in the news media, here at the news media, you can see it perhaps in the Hollywood group, however you want to look at it, America is slowly doing a slight turn. There's not quite the tolerance today for, I'll say this, door knocking as there once was. Back during Brother Priest's day, brother, you could go door knocking all day long. Rarely had a, a person had a problem. Today, it's not quite the same, is it? Sharing your faith, I used to sit up at Barnes and Nobles with the Bible out in preparation for Sunday school sometimes. I would challenge you today to do that and see what happens. I've had some bad experiences the last couple of years with that. Um, I, I like my Bible. I don't want it all torn up. But is suffering for Christ part of being a Christian? John chapter 15. Let's look at what our Heavenly Father has to say about this. John chapter 15. If you'll follow along this morning, if you don't have a Bible, look on. John 15, 18 tells us, if the world hates you, Ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, here it is, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep Yours also. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, to go along with this, folks were living in relatively, I'll say this carefully, easy times. Are we not? We are. We're, uh, we're not holding this lesson this morning in communist China. Amen? Amen. Okay? Be, uh, just think with me this morning. Is suffering for Christ part of being a Christian? Yes, it is. 
And I think the hardest part is yet to come. The Bible speaks about that. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, look at me in verse number 12. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus, what does it say here? Shall suffer persecution. But you notice what it's prefaced with, all that live godly. There's something about doing right that bothers some folks. I don't know what it is, except that it's just there's something about man's conscience. Now you try to live right and you try to do right and not join in with the rest, and it just annoys folks, does it not? But it does say here, all that live godly, look what it says here again in verse 12, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Whether you've gone through it, whether you're going through it, you will be going through it at some point. Amen? If you're going to take a stand for Christ, that people actually know that you believe in Christ, and that you take a stand, you're going to suffer some kind of persecution. I guarantee it. Now, does that mean you to quit taking a stand for Christ? No. That's the, the thrust of this lesson this morning. Now, here's the next question for you. Is the suffering mentioned by Paul in Philippians 129 that we just read viewed as a curse or benefit? A curse or a blessing? Is it a curse? No. Must be the other then, isn't it? You mean to tell me that being able to suffer with Christ is considered a privilege? It is. Now, I want you to look with me in Philippians, and I want you to think about this. In Philippians chapter 3, go back to Philippians 3, if you would, please. I want you to think with me just for a minute. How, well, let's read these verses here. Philippians 3, look with me in Philippians 3, verse 7. You find your place in Philippians 3, 7? It says, but what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God, how? By faith, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, ah, and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. This matter of, of suffering for Christ, Paul considers it a privilege and a blessing. Now, I'm not sure I've got the victory over that part of it yet. Amen? But I want you to think with me just for a minute. If I had to explain this to you folks this morning, and all week long I've been thinking, how am I going to do this? I hope this makes some sense. You can read about combat. You can watch actual war footage. Can you not? You can talk to the vets out there. And I suggest if you have that opportunity to do so, it's a privilege. You might be surprised what you can learn from those guys. Amen. You can do all these things, but you're never going to experience what combat veterans have gone through. Are you? Unless you've been in combat yourself. You follow me here? There's a certain fellowship that only combat veterans can relate to. Is there not? They can relate to the the tough times in the trenches and the foxholes that can relate to losing their, their friends, that can relate to being wounded, they can relate to many, many things. It's like you've, seen, you've heard of the band of brothers. You can make this application to sports. I can read about it, I can watch it on TV all day, but until I've played the game, amen, I can't relate all the way with it. You might think about this matter of suffering for Christ. No, I'm not going to suffer like my Heavenly Father has for us, amen? But you realize there's a special fellowship with Christ, folks, that only the Christian can relate to. Does that make sense? There's a fellowship of my Heavenly Father this morning that, that, that's unique, that's special, that's important to me. I can relate to some things. I will not do, uh, suffer as my Savior has, but we're going to go through some things. And, and here's the thing. 
you're able to think with me here for a minute. You're able to experience firsthand the working of God's grace and power in your life. Now, here's the beauty when you fall into trouble and difficult times or, or persecution is I have somebody who's been through this already for me, okay? I want to get to know my Heavenly Father better because he's going to be able to help me through it. Does that make sense? Folks, does that make sense? If you have a close relationship with your Heavenly Father and you find yourself in the midst of persecution, don't consider it, oh no. Now here's, again, let me back this up. Be doing right. It's one thing, and 1 Peter addresses this. It's one thing to be uh, persecuted when you're doing wrong. <laughs> Amen? But what about when you're doing right and you're still persecuted? But think with me here. Look with me, if you would, please, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. The beauty of being saved is I'm part of a large family. Amen? A large family of brothers and sisters. Huh? Yes. What's more, being saved, I have a heavenly Father. Now think about this, who thinketh upon me. I think that comes out of Psalm chapter 40, latter part of that chapter. I'm poor and needy. Amen? But he knows everything about each of us this morning. He knows what you can bear, what you're not able to bear. He won't put on you more than you, amen? But here's the thing, what's neat about this. Look with me in, in 2 Corinthians chapter uh, number one. Look with me in verse three. The beauty of being part of this family is each of you have gone through different things in your life. And you've experienced the working of God's grace and God's power. Have you not? In verse three it says, blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 1. The Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comfort us in all our tribulation, that we may, look here, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. What God has taken you through, what some of you have experienced in your own life or own experiences, is God's able to use that in your life and other people's lives as well. If you suffered persecution for the cause of Christ, just door knocking, you can be an encouragement to a young Christian or a new Christian who hasn't been out there and experienced that. Say, look, you go out in the name of the Lord, you go out with a measure of charity and a special measure of God's humility for the cause of Christ, and God will help you and take care of you. Well, you're not going to be liked. That comes with the territory. But I can relate that to other people if you haven't been out there. If you've had to spend time in a hospital with somebody, amen, and you've been through that before, God has allowed things into your life or perhaps a child or some family member, and you don't fully understand it at the time, God could use this later on down the road to help somebody else that has not been there. So this band of brothers and sisters is important, is it not? Yes. The fellowship of his sufferings, the beauty of it is you get to experience. Now just think with me here for a minute. If we would just take the time and be patient and recognize God doing things in our life in the midst of what we consider bad news, why not step back this next time and watch the hand of God at work and ask God to help you to be part of the solution, not the problem. Ask God to help you to be in a spirit of prayer versus complaining. Ask God to help you see the big picture. You don't know what's coming down the road necessarily this week. God has a plan for each of us. But the beauty of it, it, it with, with Paul understood God's power, God's grace at work. And he clung to that. You're going to experience some issues, folks, if you haven't, it's coming, amen. This fellowship of suffering you're going to want to be close to your heavenly father. Okay? Yep. And you're going to want to be close to each other too. It's good to know God's people are praying for one another. It ought to draw God's people. When one suffer, we all suffer, the Bible says. We ought to be drawn closer together. 
So is it viewed as a curse or a benefit, this suffering Paul mentions? Oh, we'll have to teach this all again. So, no. <laughs> It's viewed as a benefit. It's a privilege to suffer for Christ. You won't fully understand it at the time. Sometimes you don't understand it till later. And sometimes you kick yourself a little bit because you blew it. Amen. God was working all the time. You just failed to see it. Now, let me ask you this question. If a Christian is persecuted, <laughs> you're in Texas, folks, so go along here. Is retaliation or revenge an appropriate response? Absolutely. Amen. Well, of course it is. Is it? Come on, is it? No. no. Will you want to? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I can back into his car just like he did mine. Amen? Yes. But folks, this, this, is, this is Christianity 101. The old nature wants to get even. Amen? I don't have to put up with this. Why not? Your heavenly father did. Amen. Christ ought to be your example. Look with me, if you would, please, in Matthew chapter 5. The broad strokes of the brush today on this matter of suffering, persecution, trials, and tribulations, just bear with. You could teach on this for weeks and break it down and break it down. Matthew 5, verse 38. Ye have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Stop. I usually stop right there. Amen? Do I have company? There it is right there, brother. <laughs> there it is. Huh? Oh, wait a minute. But, I owned nuts. But I say unto you that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. I'll tell you what, if you drive on these highways, and John, I won't park on this too long, but I'll tell you what, it takes me about two minutes to get my temperature gauge way up over the top. There's just flat out, I'm never rude, but the others, amen? Huh? I, I don't know what it is. I can be in a slow lane and I'll have a truck's bumper on mine because they're not getting out of his way in the fast lane. And then they're waving back there wildly and you can tell whatever. Anyway, it's... Now, you think that's, but folks, this is going to go on this week, probably every day. And God's going to take you back to this classroom and back to it and back to it and back to it until you get over that speed bump, excuse the pun, amen? Until you learn to deal with anger management for one. But listen, not everybody's going to like you or your driving, okay? That may seem petty, but this goes on all the time. It's a good character test, isn't it? But let's go on here. I'm getting off on a rabbit trail. But I send to you that you resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. If a man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. Whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him, Twain. Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow thee, turn not thou away. Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them. This really gets annoying, doesn't it? Now I'm being careful here in tongue in cheek. This is the word of God and God's instruction Christian under grace today. Amen? God help me to apply just part of this. Bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Why? That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. He maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. If you love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same. Ye salute your brethren only, Christian, but do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so? Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Romans chapter 12, a follow up to this. Quickly, Romans 12. See, this eliminates my excuse making for the week, doesn't it? These verses will come back to me this week. Pray for them which despitefully use you. 
Amen. I, I tell you what, that, that's a struggle. It is. Romans chapter 12, verse 14. Look at these verses. Oh, Brother Doug, you had to just double down here. Verse 14 of Romans 12. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice. Weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Now that's a plateful, isn't it? God help me just to apply some of this. Amen? Just some of it. We're going to be challenged. It may be this afternoon already, but you're going to be challenged. You just bow your head in prayer today when you eat lunch. It's not quite the same out there anymore. The tenor's changed a little bit. But let me say this. You bow your head and pray anyway. Amen? Not to be, now listen, not to be haughty and arrogant because it's the right thing to do to thank God for your food. It's okay. Who... You never know who's watching on both sides of the aisle. You just don't know. Now, why does God allow suffering in a Christian's life? Because <gasps> he doesn't like me. He may not like some of your actions. I get it. Amen? Why does God allow suffering in a Christian's life. Think just for a minute. Why? What's that, John? I can't hear anymore either, John, so. We're the same age, aren't we, John? So, uh, so, so. Wow. Can only get worse, brother. <laughs> Anybody else? To help others, sure. Yeah. Anybody else? To strengthen our faith. Strengthen your faith. Amen. Good. Anybody else? I'd say Jesus said Yeah. Mm hmm I'm sorry. Become holy. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I'm ruining this, aren't I, myself? Amen. <laughs> I need somebody, one of you young people running around with a microphone, amen? Uh, yeah, why does God allow suffering in our life? Now, I, wanna, I want you to think with me for a second here. Good answers. This is the kind of suffering that puts strength, patience, and faith to the test. But I don't want you to confuse this, you listening, with suffering that is a result of our own sin. Did you catch that? Don't confuse the suffering that Paul's speaking about, or our Lord, with that suffering that comes with and a result of we reap what we sow. There's two Old Testament figures that come to mind. We won't look at their lives, but can you think of a couple? Well, Job's a great example for suffering, but let's think of somebody who's maybe not been quite doing what God wants him to do. David. Solomon. David. King Solomon. All, the, all three. Solomon, David, Samson. David, a man after God's own heart. Yet the Bible tells us that the thing that David had done, what? Displeased the Lord. And there's always the price to pay. So if you're caught up in that this morning, well, I've just been suffering for Jesus. Well, have you been living for Jesus is the question. If you haven't been, perhaps God's allowing <laughs> some things to try to get your attention. Amen? You're with me? With the Lord at least? 
In 1 Peter chapter 5, we're running out of time here, but look with me in 1 Peter chapter 5. Yes, God is trying to do a work in our lives. God is going to allow some things into our life we will not understand. I was right at the beginning. Perhaps later on, I hope, you know, things become clear. But you live and you do right for God. And God's still going to allow circumstances, events, however, persecution, however you want to look at this morning, into your life to, to try to accomplish some things. I mentioned this last week. Some of your best airline pilots are those that have gone through some rough weather up there. Huh? Some of your best ship's captains are those who have gone through some very serious storms at sea. You don't learn to be the best ship captain in calm seas all the time or the best airline pilot in beautiful weather. You get challenged with it. Some of your strongest Christians, and you look at the life of the Apostle Paul, I'm convinced that God tempered him, molded him, shaped him with various circumstances and events in his life. I don't think Paul even understood them all when it was happening. But he could speak to them and about them and share his experiences with other people and be a help. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse number 10, it tells us, But the God of all grace, and boy, that's a good one underline there, who hath called us unto his eternal glory, how by Christ Jesus, after that she have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Right there. It's almost kind of put right out there for you. Bang, 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 bang. Isn't it? Why does God allow suffering in our lives? Yeah, look here. You think of able to what? Make you perfect. When I think of that word perfect, I think of spiritual maturity. Okay? Spiritual maturity. In Acts with the Philippian jailer with Paul in Acts 16... An immature Paul would not have been able to deal with that situation. But God had grown Paul and matured Paul, was able to put Paul and use Paul and bring those circumstances into his life to reach somebody in prison. Which I wouldn't have welcomed that at the time myself. Not mature enough. Not seeing the big picture. I think of this matter of spiritual maturity. Also in the sense of Paul, and this is a big one for a lot of us, self at the top of this list, I haven't arrived yet. But Paul was still pressing towards the mark. He, he understood he didn't have all the answers, but he sure, wanted to, he sure desired to know his Savior better and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. And Paul was still pressing towards the mark. He hadn't quit. He hadn't fallen by the wayside. The persecutions, the trials, the afflictions that had been sent his way had, had molded him, had shaped him, had strengthened him, had built some spiritual backbone in his life. He didn't fall by the wayside. You think of perfect, you think of this matter of establish, what comes to mind. I think of spiritual stability. In Psalm chapter 40, look at me in Psalm chapter 40 very quickly here. I like these verses, Psalm chapter 40. Not only spiritual maturity, but spiritual stability. I waited patiently for the Lord in verse 1 of Psalm 40, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock, and established my goings. What more? He's put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it in fear and shall trust in the Lord. Christ Jesus, the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's never changed and never will. My heart is prone to wander. My heart is prone to drift sometimes. God wants stability in your heart and life. He wants spiritual maturity. When the alarm goes off Sunday morning, you get up by the grace of God. Amen? <clears throat> well, sometimes, brother. Amen? I forgot to set it. And when the trials and storms of life come your direction... You understand and you can see the work of God in the hand of God in your life. You learn to understand there's a bigger picture than self. Who is God trying to reach? Is it the Philippian jailer hmm? and his family? Stability. Jesus Christ, you recognize, is the rock. So stand on him. Huh? 
So when the storms of life come, guess what? The rock doesn't move. The sands shift, the sands wash away, but the rock is still there. They don't build lighthouses on sand, they build them on rock, amen? You seen those pictures of the lighthouse with the waves almost to the top? That's an impressive picture <laughs> for the guy taking it. That must have been something else, amen? Or the guy in the lighthouse. I don't know how they, uh, anyway. But that, that's a good picture, stability. Christ is our rock. When you think of strengthen, it's able to strengthen us, not only perfect, establish, to strengthen, I think of spiritual strength. We learn to lean on the Lord more and less on self. There was, even in my own life, I had to learn at some point to quit leaning on my brother Dave for the answers, okay, and learn to lean on my heavenly Father. There's a habit as a Christian to take the easy way out when things get tough. Is there not? The habit you want to establish that God is trying to teach you in your life is to look to lean on Jesus Christ. He's your rock, right? The rest is shifting sands. And not that we can't be an encouragement. We should be. But ultimately, you learn to look to Jesus Christ for your strength. In Matthew chapter 11, you should know these verses. And I will say this about the word of God. It will become very important in your heart and life when you're going through rough sledding. The 23rd Psalm will become very important to you. The Lord is my shepherd. It's personal. It's not just a general statement. It's personal. Those scriptures become very important. Not only to you, but when you're when you're used of God to share scripture. The 23rd Psalm is still asked for many times. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, it says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Come unto me, look, I'll help shoulder the load. You're going to learn after a while that you can't possibly shoulder the whole load. You're going to trip and you're going to stumble and you're going to drop part of the load at some point. God is going to, well, think with me here. Look with me in 2 Timothy chapter 1. Very quickly, 2 Timothy 1, and we're out of time, folks. But 2 Timothy 1 in closing. 2 Timothy 1, verse 7. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not thou there ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel. How? According to the power of God. We're out of time, folks, but there's one other point I want you to look at yourselves when you get time. It's also able to settle you. I think of spiritual peace. I think of the, the disciples at sea, amen, and our Lord and Savior asleep in the boat. In the midst of the storm, you know, he gets up and says, look, Lee, a little faith. There was a, Mary he calmed all that, and it was calm. And great peace took over. How about you this morning? How do you look at the suffering, and how do you relate to it as a Christian? I hope the lesson's been a help to you. 